All right, guys, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Tim, for allowing me to be in your house tonight. Uh, super good to be back, even though it's online. So uh, tonight we're going to be in the book of Romans, specifically in chapter 8. Romans is in the New Testament, if you don't know, and it was written by the Apostle Paul. It's a, it's a pretty well-known chapter in the book of Romans. In fact, uh, John Piper says about uh, Romans 8, The greatest book in the world is the Bible. The greatest letter in that book is Romans, and the greatest chapter in that letter is chapter 8. So I'm going to start off by reading the first 11 verses tonight, uh, because uh, that's all we have time for, and that's all I prepped. And uh, then I'll uh, start us off in prayer. <laughs> so, uh, chapter 8, verse 1. Uh, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. Verse 3. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. We do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh have set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mindset of the flesh is death, but the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the Spirit is, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give you life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much uh, just for the gift of uh, Kingdom Club. Thank you so much that Tim uh, was hospitable enough to uh, allow us to use his home, God. I pray that tonight you just bless everyone with uh, ears to and hearts to listen and receive the word tonight. God, I pray you just give me the tongue to articulate things well, Lord. And in all that I do tonight, Lord, let me just do it for your honor and for your glory alone. And God, I pray that your name is the name to be praised tonight. And your son's name that I praise and thank. Amen. All right, so... Paul discusses in the New Testament how the gospel transforms how we view our sin and how we review the redemptive work of Christ. The key theme in this chapter is freedom. The gospel, as Paul says, sets us free. You know, you can look at a plethora of religious backgrounds today and see that most of these, in most of these religions, people aren't free from the penalty of their sins, you know, unless they follow a set of rules, which creates, as we, uh, as we call today, a works-based faith. They are also not free from the power of sin, which results in their continuous unrepentant sin. So let's dive into verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. This is arguably one of the most powerful, quote-unquote, therefores in the English language. Typically in the Bible, whenever you see the word therefore, it's used as a signaling word to point to the previous verse in order to give a conclusion for that verse. Here, it introduces the results of Paul's teachings not only in the previous chapter, but the first seven chapters as a whole in the book of Romans. He explains that, Paul explains that justification is by faith alone on the basis of God's overwhelming grace. Justification, if you don't know, is the act by which God calls you righteous in Christ. It's also known as a legal declaration. So to be justified is to be made right with God, in a sense. You can also look at the word condemnation as the antithesis of the word justification. Condemnation refers to a verdict of being guilty and the penalty that that said verdict demands. There is no sin that a believer in Jesus Christ can commit, past, present, and future, that can be held against him or her, because the penalty was paid by Christ. And through Jesus Christ's righteousness, through Jesus Christ, his righteousness was given to his children, so that when the Father looks at us, he doesn't judge us for our sin, he doesn't judge us for the sum of our past mistakes, but of the blood of Christ that was shed for us. But in this verse, Paul is answering the dilemma of an unbeliever in chapter 7 of Romans. If you read chapter 7, you'll see that Paul basically is lamented about how much the unbeliever struggles with sin. And in fact, he ends chapter 7 by saying, and if you want to go to uh, verse 21, you can read along with me. Um, it says, So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. Verse 23, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. 
you know, and I kind of, I kind of envision Paul sort of like, you know, throws up his hands in the air and I envision he says, you know, what a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? And what's interesting, he answers the question right after by saying in, in the next verse, thanks be to God, it is through Jesus Christ our Lord. So now he asks, and I'm paraphrasing, well, since unbelievers continue to struggle with so much unrepentant sin, how much condemnation can I, a believer in Christ, expect to experience? Paul's answer to that, Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation, as I said, is a legal term, if you don't know. It means that there is a charge that is being held against you. It means that you owe a debt or a payment. For those in Christ, that debt no longer exists because that debt has been paid in full. Charles Spurgeon used to say that for those in Christ, it would be unjust for God to hold a believer responsible for sin because that would be requiring two payments for the same sin. For example, if you can't understand that, if my electric bill is like super high one month because I kept the air set at like 55 degrees, but my father comes in and pays it in full, but then the electric company comes back to me and says, well, Sam, we expect you to pay that, we expect you to pay the bill too because you know you were the one that set the temperature so low. I would say that's not fair. You know, my father came in and he paid that bill in full and now you have no more claim on me. Paul says, if I am in Christ, God will not, cannot condemn me. If I am in Christ, God can't condemn me for my sins because Jesus was fully condemned for it. For God to hold me accountable for even an ounce of it would be requiring two payments for the same debt. This declaration of no condemnation applies to both your past and your future sins. Many Christians today understand that Jesus paid for their sins, something like, well, you know, he wiped the slate clean, so to speak, but they think that if they commit a future sin, um, then you might get like, you know, recondemned for those. Um, but then Paul says, Paul stops that and he says, not if you're in Christ. Now, thinking about this logically, when Christ died on the cross for your sins, how many of your sins had you committed yet? Not a single one, right? It means that when Christ died on the cross for us and suffered the wrath and anger of God, he atoned for every single one of our sins. In fact, when Paul wrote these words years ago, quote unquote, no condemnation, none of us had committed our sins yet. Jesus' death wiped out not only the presence of existing condemnation, he wiped out the possibility of future condemnation. This means that there is literally nothing you could do right now that would make God love you any more than he already does. And there's nothing that you could do that would make him love you any less. You are in Christ, which means that there is nothing that can be impede or endanger God's love or acceptance of you. A lot of Christians today think that God loves you the more that you become like Christ. I love this quote by Rankin Wilborn. It says, Rankin says, God doesn't love you to the degree that you are like Christ. He loves you to the degree that you are in Christ. And that is always 100%. Because now he loves you like he loves Jesus. Now, obviously, don't hear me wrong and think that there shouldn't be a pattern of victory over sin in your life. If you don't see a pattern of victory over sin in your life, you know, if you're not waging war against your sin, if you think, well, you know, since no one's perfect, you know, I mean, it's okay. You know, if you think that and truly believe that, I would encourage you to examine your heart because you may not be saved according to the standards of scripture, if that's the case. And if you don't believe me, look at how Paul ends verse one. He says, to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now back to Wilborn's quote, I like it so much, I'm just gonna say it again. God doesn't love you to the degree that you are like Christ. He loves you to the degree that you are in Christ. And that is always 100% because now he loves you like he loves Jesus. This means, and this is crazy to think, this means that God loves you just as much as he loved Christ when he finished preaching the Sermon on the Mount. I like to think about this because can you, all of you, you should picture, can you imagine the joy of the Father when Christ finished that sermon? God must have been so pleased, so proud, and just happy with his son when he completed that task. Now that's the same love that God has for his children. Why? It's because they are in Christ. My goal for you guys tonight is to let that sink in. Because when you do that, you will free yourself from the penalty of sin. I now never have to be unsure of God's love for me if I'm a follower of Christ. In all my mess and in all my Romans 7 struggle, when I become a believer, I have the unconditional love and loving acceptance of my Father. Now check this out. This not only frees me from the penalty of sin, but it also frees me from the power of sin. 
because there's literally nothing about me that can be revealed that God has not already seen and that his blood has not already covered. So now when I talk about my testimony and how I was dead to my sins, I said, yeah, I was a slave to my sins and God saw all of it. Yet he still elected me in eternity's past and sent his son to die for me. And because of this, he has promised to change me and reconcile me with him. Typically, we sing a lot of, we sing a lot of hymns here in Kingdom Club um, with a lot of rich theology and meaning. And one that we haven't sang is to be, sorry, to his be the victor's name, which in a line says, long may the accuser roar of sins that I have done. I know them all and thousands more. Jehovah remembereth none. And that's based off of Hebrews 8, 12, if you guys wanna check that out later. Long may the accuser roar. And sometimes that can even be of my own conscience of the sins that I have done. Long may the accuser roar of sins that I have done. I know them all and thousands more. Jehovah remembereth none. So now going to verse two. Because the law of the spirit of life in Christ, Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Keyword in this verse is the word because, because it connects this verse to the previous verse. So here's how I know for a fact, this verse, here's how I know for a fact I am under no condemnation. The reason I know that I am under no condemnation is because I see a law, quote unquote, in me that is leading me away from the sin, sorry, from sin and of death. Now real quick, don't look at the word law in this verse and you know let it throw you out because Law, in, in this context, isn't solely in reference to the Old Testament Mosaic law. When you see the word law in this context, read it like the word principle. Um, this means that there is a new principle at work in me. You know, we used to operate according to the old principle um, that if we kept the law good enough, we'd be accepted. The problem with that is we discovered that the law couldn't change our hearts. And if anything, the law made us more fearful and more sinful and more aware of our sin. But now Paul says there is a new principle. There is a new law that is at work in my heart and in my life. And that new law slash principle is the life-giving power from the Holy Spirit. The Mosaic law from the Old Testament would say to us today, you know, only if you're good enough or only if you do good enough, then you'll be accepted, right? God now says, no, I will produce righteous behavior in you through the power of my spirit. Now, the spirit is a pretty large theme in this chapter, and we're going to come back to that. Um, but again, let's review the connection from these two verses. How do I know for sure that there is no condemnation for me? It is if I see the Spirit of God at work in me. Listen to this. The necessary complement to the forgiveness of sins is getting released from the power of sin. It's like the other side of the salvation coin, if you kind of think about it. If, like, if one side is freedom from the penalty of sin, the other side is freedom for the power of sin. If you are forgiven of your sins, if you have repented of your sins, if you have picked up your cross to follow Christ, then you have been changed. If Jesus' death has released you from the penalty of sin so that there is no condemnation, then Jesus' spirit and his resurrection life starts to release you from the power of sin. And those two are always going to go hand in hand. So what is life without the spirit, exactly? I think this is best illustrated in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 19, if you guys want to go there. In these verses, Paul will give us a few characteristics of ungodly lifestyles, which believers are called to reject. So starting in verse 17, it says, So this I say and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk, in the futility of their mind. The word walk here is expressing a daily um, continuous conduct. Um, if you don't know what Gentiles means, um, it just in, in this context, it's meaning unregenerate pagans. And the very end, the futility of their mind. This is just expressing that the minds of unbelievers have been distorted, which causes them to produce an ungodly understanding of morality. Because Christians are a part of the body of Christ and have received the Holy Spirit and are being edified by other believers in Christ, they should not continue to live and walk like the rest of the ungodly. Verse 18, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the hardness of their heart. Unbelievers are naturally separated from God. Because of this, they are ignorant and blind to God's truth, which causes them to be hard, hard to truth, as opposed to being soft and teachable. Verse 19, And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. So my question to those of you who are not sure if you are saved, 
Are you walking in truth by the grace of the Spirit? Galatians 5, are you walking by the Spirit? Are you gratifying the lusts of your sinful nature? Or are you walking in freedom and standing firm so that you are not burdened by a yoke of slavery to your sins? A question that my dad used to ask my brother and I when we were young was, if you guys died tonight, how do you know that God would let you in heaven? And this is a great question, and you should have the right answer for it, because there's only one right answer for it. The right answer is because Jesus paid for my sin debt in full, and because there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. Equally important to this question is another question, and that's not if you die tonight, but if you get up tomorrow, is your life going to be different because the Spirit of God is in you? Are you seeing a pattern of victory over sin in your life? Are you picking up your cross daily, denying yourself, and following Christ? Bottom line, are you living in freedom? Christ said your sins are forgiven, but did you arise and walk by the Spirit? And how do we know that Christ is our Savior? We would know if the Spirit has given us a transformed life. Roman, or sorry, not Romans, James 3.18, I will show you my faith by my works. Another example from the life of Christ comes from John chapter 8. A woman is brought to Jesus who is caught in the very act of adultery. I'll read it quick um, so that those of you who don't know the context um, know what the story is about. Um, I'm going to start in verse 2, actually. And I'm going to go to verse 11. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in the act of adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write in the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, If any one of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Jesus says to her, Neither do I condemn you. What's interesting to note, um, what's interesting to note here is that the order that Christ puts those phrases in, forgiveness is always accompanied by change. Now look at this. Neither do I condemn you comes before go and sin no more. And it's significant because most of us today would rephrase those, saying something like, you know, if you go and sin no more, you know, then I'll consider not condemning you. So why did Christ put, neither do I condemn you before go and sin no more? Christ was simply clarifying an aspect of the gospel. The gospel message isn't simply stop sinning because that would be an impossible message. The gospel message is behold the love and sacrifice given to us by Jesus Christ. And through the work of the Holy Spirit that was granted to us by the Father, then you will have the power to stop sinning. God's love and sacrifice for his children is the power that liberates us from sin. Not a reward for us liberating ourselves, for if we liberated ourselves, there would be no use for Christ's sacrifice. Going back to verses 1 and 2 Romans 8, it articulates the two types of freedom, the freedom from sin that come with salvation. Paul says that, Jesus is, or that by Jesus' death, we are free from the penalty of sin, and by his spirit, he has, he has released us from the power of sin. These two always go together, like I said. John MacArthur uses the definition of grace and mercy in order to explain these freedoms. He says that mercy differs from grace and that grace removes guilt, the guilt of the penalty of sin, while mercy takes away the misery caused by the power of sin. If you are a follower of Christ, you have received the undeserved relief of misery that accompanies Christ's saving grace. Now in verses three and four, Paul further unpacks the unity between these two freedoms. He says, verse three, what the law, meaning the Old Testament law, what the law could not do since it was weakened by the flesh. In other words, the law was making all these commands in which we weren't able to obey. What the law could not do since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh 
by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering in order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit jesus released us from the law by being born in the flesh and living the life that we were supposed to live which is a life of perfect obedience to god's law and then dying a death of a sin offering verse 3 for those that were called according to his purpose and that offering that sacrifice freed us from the penalty of sin which made way for the spirit to indwell in us which would fulfill the law's requirement in us verse 4 now you may ask what's the law's requirement in us the law's requirement is that we do what is righteous jesus summarized it in matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 by saying love the lord your god with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind this is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it love your neighbor as yourself when the spirit comes in you he will begin to grant these things in you because like i said god's not just after your obedience he's after a whole new kind of obedience he's after an obedience that is rooted in a desire he wants you to seek obedience not because you're forced to or because you're threatened with hell if you don't but an obedience that you seek because you crave God and his glory. Our college pastor, Darren, in reference to Paul's evangelism to the Jewish people said, and I'm paraphrasing, Paul was burdened that the unbelieving Jews would come to know the Messiah so that they could give God all the glory. Paul's zeal for God's glory fueled his evangelical work to unbelievers. Paul says that this desire for God's glory and to be righteous for him wasn't produced by the law, The law can tell you all day what you should and shouldn't do, right? But it can't change your desires. It can't change your heart. Those desires can only be given to you by the life-giving power of the Spirit. What the law could never do, the Spirit does through the work of the gospel. So how practically does this change get produced in us? Well, Paul tells us, it's when, verse 4, we do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. If you're confused what that means, don't worry. Paul explains it in the next verse. He says, For those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on the things of the Spirit. In other words, walking by the Spirit is accomplished by setting your minds on the things of the Spirit. Notice also how it doesn't say setting your mind on the Spirit, but instead setting your mind on the things of the Spirit. The reason this is important is because, you know, a lot of Christians today are just obsessed with the Spirit and They think, you know, you get really spiritual, you know, you hear hear his voice all the time, but just be cautious with that mindset. If you ever want to hear the Lord speak to you, just dive into the word of God. At our hands, we have the mindset of God, which we can refer to whenever we need to. So what does it mean to set your minds on the things of the spirit? It means having your mind set on what the spirit thinks about. It means you love what the spirit loves. You seek what the spirit seeks. I'll ask Tim and Zion. Does anyone here know what fellowship means? Yes, Tim. <laughs> so fellowship is the unity that we have with Christ and each other through Christ's sacrifice. Yes. That we can actually um, truly love one another and yes. together in brotherly and sisterly love. Yeah, yeah. So in a sense, it's kind of like, it's like a friendship and it's a companionship that is rooted in love and in encouragement. When you're in fellowship with someone, what do you talk about? The things that you love. Whenever I get together with my high school buddies, we talk about the same things whenever we get together. We talk about Christ, we talk about music, we talk about working out, because that's what we all do. This is what friendship is. So when you're in fellowship with the Spirit, you're thinking about what the Spirit loves. So what is this? If you go to Philippians 4, 8, it says, Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, If there is any excellence and anything, and if anything is worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The Spirit loves the glory of Jesus and the sharing of his truth. And here's the key. As you dwell on these things, the Spirit and you are in fellowship. And where he is, so is his redemptive power. And if you have the gift of the Spirit, then your life will begin to bear fruit spiritually and you'll begin to walk by the Spirit. Continuing in Romans 8, verses 6. Now the mindset of the flesh is death. But the mindset of the spirit is life and peace. Some of your versions may say uh, carnally minded in the beginning or mindset of the flesh. This just basically means that a person with the mindset of the flesh is spiritually dead. Whereas a person 
um, that has a mindset on the things of the spirit is very much spiritually alive and at peace with God. Now you may ask Sam, what is the mindset of the flesh? In the next verse, Paul lays it out as an attitude of hostility towards God. J.D. Greer broke this down into what we know as the five selves, or what he considers the mindset of the flesh. And I'll just list those for you if you guys are taking notes. Number one, self-will, meaning that I don't care what God's will is for me in my life, right? I want to do what I want to do because I think I know what's best for me. Number two, self-glory. I want the approval of people and I want to be noticed. I'm not concerned about how people are looking at God, but I'm concerned with me. And here's the scary part about self-glory. You guys don't have to go there, but Galatians 1.10 says, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Number three, self-gratification. Self-gratification means that I prioritize my comfort and my feelings of fulfillment more than I desire the will of God. Self-righteousness goes hand in hand with self-glory. I want to distinguish how good I am compared to others so I can be accepted. Maybe to impress my pastor, um, just giving examples, maybe to impress my pastor or even the leadership of Kingdom Club um, so, even, or, so I can enter leadership myself, you know? Self-sufficiency, number five. Similar to self-righteousness, I am good enough and strong enough to overcome my sin on my own. Now, what do you notice is the root sin in all of the five selves? Pride. And what, you ask, why should we worry about pride? Thomas Watson says about pride, pride is like a spiritual drunkenness that flies up like wine to the brain and intoxicates it. It is an idolatry. A proud man is a self-worshipper. Pride seeks to ungod God. Now going back to the five selves, fellowshipping with the spirit, in a sense, means putting God in each of these places where you used to have yourself. So instead of self-will, you say, well, not my will, but your will, O Lord. Instead of self-glory, it becomes not to my glory, but to your glory forever and ever. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Self-gratification becomes, hey, my bread and my satisfaction is to do the will of my Father. Self-righteousness is where you say, I know that my works and my righteousness are nothing but filthy rags, but my righteousness has become complete in you, O Lord, because Christ has become my righteousness. Self-sufficiency says, I can't because of my circumstances, but whether you have a lot or whether you have a little, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. These are the things of the Spirit. But remember that at any given moment, whether you're at church singing hymns, whether you're here serving at Kingdom Club, whether you're up here teaching, you know, with a Bible in your hands, or, you know, if you're in the HC, you know, like, you know, showing off your internships or, you know, research uh, things and stuff like that, at any given point, there is a self-given focus in your heart or there is a God-centered focus in your heart. If it happens to be self-focused, you're grieving the Spirit of God. It means that, you know, when you're standing in the church, you're singing songs, or you're serving coffee, what is your motivation behind those things? Whose approval are you seeking in those instances? Is it man's approval? Or are you thinking like Christ thinks? Are you seeking the approval of the Father while being in fellowship with His Spirit? The result is that through his presence, he's producing the fruits of the Spirit. And again, what if the most devastating effect, what if the most devastating effect of your sin was not the damages it caused to you or to someone else, but the loss of the fruits of the Spirit in your life? Back to Romans 8, verses 7, it says, The mindset of the flesh is hostile towards God because it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it is unable to do so. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. This is Paul recapping uh, what he previously said in chapter 7. Paul is explaining that there is a flesh or known as your sinful nature part of you that is totally against God and totally for yourself. Verse 8 says, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Paul doesn't mean that um, a person that doesn't know God, you know, can never commit a noble deed or think a good thought, you know. Paul just means that the core of who that person is, an unbeliever, in accordance to their sinful nature, they are more loyal to themselves than they are to God. And that makes them displeasing to God. Psalm 14 says that they are even detestable to God. If you don't understand that, think of that in terms of this example. Imagine a man in a rebel army. Keep that, keep that in mind, rebel army. Imagine a man in a rebel army who, you know, looks after his comrades. He keeps his uniform clean. 
He keeps it pressed, he's brave, has a great work ethic, he's always truthful with his superiors, super punctual. You know, each of those actions are good actions, right? But they are all done in the context of hostility to the rightful ruler. You would never expect that ruler to hear this rebel's conscientiousness and be pleased by his conduct. Because even though these are all, you know, good actions, they were done in the context of hostility to the rightful ruler, or in a sense, hostility towards God. Verse 9, we're almost done. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Some of your versions may use the word dwells when talking about the Spirit of God. The Greek word for dwells means to inhabit someone's abode permanently. Verse 10, Now if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. Verse 11, And if the Spirit of man who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his Spirit who lives in you. Verse 10, the only way to have a relationship with Christ is through faith and submission to him. The only other way to get into heaven would be to be perfect and never commit a sin. And according to Ephesians 2, even believers were dead in our sins at one point, before the Spirit granted us repentance. You can uh, see the reference for that, 2 Timothy 2, verses 25, if you want to go there later. Wherever the Spirit is, there is life. And that's what Paul's explaining in verse 11. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. That is the hope of the followers of Christ. And in that hope, there is freedom, for there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you so much for this time, Lord. We just thank you so much, God, just for all the men in my life that uh, contributed to this message and corrected it. Um, edited it with me, God. We just thank you so much for their sacrificing in their times, God. Thank you so much, God, for enabling me to speak tonight and for giving me the courage to do so, Lord. God, we just pray for FAU, God, and just the entire world, God, that um, healing can just be brought to the entire world and we can go to life as normal, God. And if it's in your will, God, have Kingdom Club in person. God, we just praise you and thank you, God. And God, in all that we do, Lord, let us do it for your honor and for your glory, Lord. We thank you. In Christ's name, amen. amen. All right. Are we, you want to come up here?